Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Thanks for joining us for the last episode of Your Legislators from this legislative session. Joining us this morning is Representative Bill McCanley from District 33. How are you doing this morning? I'm here, I'm vertical. Grandma always said that was better than the alternative, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get right to it. The session has just ended. What was your overall opinion on how this session went? Well, it was very difficult. And, you know, the voters chose to have a Republican governor a Democratic Senate and a Republican House of Representatives and that was that happened for the first time in I think 60 years and so many of the folks on I'm a Democrat obviously and on the other side of the aisle uh, decided that they had a lot of things that they wanted to do that they weren't able to do for the last 60 years and so there were many many contentious issues uh, that were brought up almost on a daily basis everything from um, really trying to take away the power of unions, to flunking third graders, to uh, lowering unemployment benefits, uh, to trying to take away driver's license from uh, undocumented folks living here in town. I mean, it was, it was very, very contentious. And not a lot of things got done because those things got killed in the Senate. And I guess you can call that gridlock and that's probably accurate, but I don't know if most of that was based on any sort of political will. It was just a very different opinion on what is the direct uh, best way forward for our communities in the state. So it, it was very tiring. Uh, it was very contentious. Uh, we did get a budget done, which is good because that's what we need to fund the state. Um, and there were a couple of things that got done that I think are, are very good. One of which was uh, an effort I was involved with that will allow New Mexico to be one of the first states in the country uh, to grow industrial hemp. Now, a lot of people mistake hemp, the, the plant, with marijuana because they're basically the same plant, only hemp does not have THC. If you smoke it, the only effect you're going to get is a headache. But we actually uh, made hemp illegal when we made marijuana illegal, but we also import something like $620 million worth of hemp products from Canada every year. And so it's illegal for us to grow it, but our companies use it in everything from bath oil to seat cushions for cars. And so uh, there's been an effort, a lot of times led bipartisanly uh, by Mitch McConnell, who's the Republican chair or uh, head of the US Senate in Kentucky to allow uh, universities and departments of agriculture to grow hemp on a research basis. So we passed that, uh, so we can start that program here right actually at New Mexico State and then if the federal government ever changes the law at, the, at that level, we will then automatically change our law as well. So it's, it'll be good to be in the front foot on that. New Mexico sometimes lags behind other states in moving forward with things. And uh, this way we're on the leading edge and it'll be great for our farmers. It'll be great for our economy. So we're really, that's one thing I'm actually really happy about that, that got done in the session. Right, and what does that mean for New Mexico State University that they're gonna get to start growing this on a trial basis? Yeah, so the Department of Agriculture is actually located here at New Mexico State and they are going to be able to start a program. Now it's going to take them six months probably to get their approvals for the DEA, uh, but once they have that and they've developed the procedures they need to move forward, uh, you'll be able to see some places growing this plant and basically on an experimental basis. We want to see, okay, uh, is there a variety that grows good in the desert? How much water is it going to need to grow? What are the methods we need to cultivate it in terms of the equipment, et cetera, and so on? So we'll have that information. So as soon as the federal government changes their law and they're doing that right now, there's a bill sneaking its way through Congress. So it, as soon as it gets passed and gets signed by the president, our law automatically allows us to have a go at this. And it'll be really, really good for our economy. So as much as it was difficult, there were a few victories here and there, and that was a big one, both for the state, uh, for farmers, and New Mexico State, which I'm really happy to represent. 
Now, you mentioned that that gets confused with the marijuana plant yes. a lot. And that was another bill that you had ah, this session. I want to bring that up, don't you? And that was kind of doomed from the start almost. There wasn't a lot of Republican support for it, obviously. No. And there wasn't a lot of support for it at the Democratic Party either. There was a lot of people against it in the Democratic Party. Why bring up a bill that is almost doomed from the start at something like that? Well, let's, let's be real clear what happened in the legislature this year. Uh, Republican leadership took control of the House of Representatives. Now, what does that mean? They appoint members of committees and they can determine which bills go to which committees. The Republican leadership did not want a bill that would allow us to tax and regulate marijuana just like we do alcohol. So they gave it five committee assignments and the first committee they sent it to was the Agricultural Committee, which I also sit on, but it is also uh, one of the most conservative committees, Democrats and Republicans, probably in the country. <laughs> uh, even the Democrats that sit on there tend to be fairly conservative in their, in their beliefs, so it died right away. There are some Republicans that would support that. And in fact, when you go to the Senate, uh, which has Democratic control, in it, and there was a couple of bills there regarding marijuana, there was a, a constitutional amendment provision that would have put it on the ballot. That made it through, I think, one or two committees. Uh, the decriminalization bill actually made it through the whole Senate and passed. And obviously it was on the last couple of days, uh, so it didn't even have a chance to come over. Uh, obviously the Republican leadership on our side really wants to kill anything regarding marijuana. Uh, but there are Republicans that do support it. I think this is more of a generational uh, argument rather than a, uh, a political one. Yeah, I think more Democrats than Republicans obviously support it, but I think more young people support it than, than um, older people. But even with a lot of older people, you're seeing the attitude in the country change as Colorado, Oregon, Washington, the District of Columbia, Alaska. These are all five states that have allowed us to treat marijuana basically like alcohol to say this substance is obviously no more dangerous than alcohol is. Um, what we wanna do is make sure we take the power away from drug cartels. And they're the ones that are getting all the money right now from this illegal trade. And they're using it to create a terrible situation both here in the United States and internationally. And here in Las Cruces, we, we saw a very specific example of that last summer when a lot of these kids and their mamas were coming up from Honduras and El Salvador. These are some of the most violence-ridden places in the country. I think Honduras was, is second in the world in murder rate, and the only country that is ahead of them is Syria, and they're having a civil war right now. We're creating this. We allow for drug uh, money to be made here in the United States by illegal actors. These are the cartels. They take that money. They fund gangs in these countries. These gangs create a terribly violent situation. They go and recruit kids as part of their business strategy. So when people want to get away from that, they come here <laughs> and they take these really dangerous trips up through Mexico on buses or on the top of freight trains. I met a, a woman with her, I think seven-year-old kid who spent three days on top of a freight train uh, really relying on the goodness of people on the side of the, the train tracks to throw them food and water. And they just crossed the border and hoping the Border Patrol picked them up. They did. But we're creating this situation by allowing these drug cartels to make the money in an illegal, unregulated manner. If we taxed and regulated marijuana like we do alcohol, we would be able to say, okay, we're going to try to create a safer situation. We're going to turn this money into legitimate business opportunities. We're going to regulate it so it's safe. And we're going to see the tax revenue that we don't see right now because we obviously don't tax illegal uh, transactions here. So I think there's a lot of real reasons to look at this. And uh, I did sponsor a bill that would have allowed that. It was modeled on the Oregon legislation that was passed here four or five months ago. And it did fail. But it's the first time anything like that has been introduced. When you see the progression of some of the other bills on the Senate side where they've never made it that far, you are starting to see a sea change in public opinion. And it's just a matter of time. And so hopefully if we get a new governor, our governor right now is, is adamantly against uh, taxing and regulating marijuana like alcohol. And once we get a new governor, uh, I think there's a chance that we can work with uh, whoever's administration that is to craft a policy that's gonna allow us to do this in an intelligent manner and see all the benefits 
uh, that we can get from that. Right, so is this something that you plan on keep bringing up? Oh yes. It, it to me is really, frankly, unintelligent public policy to treat something like alcohol, which is one of the biggest killers in the United States. When you look at drunk driving deaths, when you look at cirrhosis of the liver, when you look at all the negative effects that it has, for instance, on violence, uh, so many people who are um, brought into emergency rooms or arrested for domestic violence are under the effects of alcohol. I mean, this is a terribly dangerous substance, but we tried making it illegal in the 20s. We tried prohibition and it failed. It was an abject failure. More people were drinking at the end of prohibition uh, than they were when it started. The murder rate in the United States from 1920 through 1932 doubled because of all the crime that making alcohol illegal created. And so I think Albert Einstein once said that the uh, definition of stupidity was doing the same thing over and over and expecting something different. Well, we're doing the same thing with marijuana, which is not as dangerous as alcohol in terms of the health effects on your body. But we're seeing the same things. We're seeing the crime. Uh, we're seeing more people smoke it. We're seeing it distributed in an unregulated manner. If we took that in and worked on it like we did alcohol. And you've seen medical marijuana here in the state be pretty successful. You see uh, Santa Fe recently decriminalized marijuana. So if we can do that, we're gonna see, uh, frankly, I think a better public policy for the state. And it's something I plan on continuing to pursue if uh, the folks in my district keep reelecting me. Right now, so obviously before you had mentioned all of the partisanship that was right. in the House and the Senate this year, um, a lot of organizations such as open government organizations and the Sheriff's Association have criticized this partisanship because they felt a lot of important legislation didn't get a chance to get passed this year. Do you find that that's going to be a problem going forward? Well, that's, I think that's a problem that's legitimately talked about in terms of partisanship. But I think the biggest problem with that kind of legislation is the way we set up our government. New Mexico, our constitution was written in 1912. Basically everyone in New Mexico was a farmer. So the thought process was you go up to Santa Fe for a couple of months in the non-farming time in the odd years, excuse me, the, yeah, the odd years. You do everything that needs to get done in the state in two months, you go home, you farm again or whatever. You come up again the next year for 30 days. You only do things related to the budget. And then you go back home and run for re-election. And that's what we do. Our, our government is based off of this model that was created in 1912. And so every other year, we're expected to get all these things done. And it's just not enough time. Because next year is only a 30-day session. All we're allowed to do is work on the budget. Mm -hmm. or what the governor decides she wants to bring up. But right. it's a much more, as limited as it is this year, it's going to be much more limited next year. So our situation only allows us to deal with everything everyone wants to talk about. So you're talking about things like workforce policies, taxes, abortion, uh, educational policy, the whole run of the gamut. And we have to get these things done in 60 days. Not only that, our legislators are unpaid. I have a job. I, work for Sunspot Solar here in Cruces. I sell solar panels to eat. And so I can't a lot of times put in the time and effort someone who's paid to do this in another state puts in because I have to go and make money so I can pay my mortgage and feed myself and all those sorts of things. And so it creates a very, very difficult situation for people who want to address a wide range of very needed and very valid issues. So I would say that the partisanship and the uh, the troubles that created negotiating between the two houses, uh, since one is one party and one is the other, that's a contributing factor. But I would say it's a much bigger factor when you look at how we're set up structurally. And I think if we're really going to truly see New Mexico move forward in this regard, so we can address issues on a more timely, thorough basis without having to scramble every two years to try to figure everything out, you're going to need to have a little bit more time and you're going to have to have legislators that have a time and also we have no staff. So I think I, I got a, I'm big onto Facebook <laughs> and I use it all the time to connect with people and, and everyone seems to be really into it. I had two days ago, people ask me about, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, veterans issues regarding uh, the DMV. Um, a guy had a 
Another issue with driver's licenses you wanted to talk about with the DMV. Someone else asked me about public employee retiree policy because what's happening right now is um, retirees from other states are being hired in New Mexico for like law enforcement or uh, fire jobs because we can't actually hire our retirees because that would be called quote unquote double dipping, which is a whole other area we can talk about. <laughs> there was one other issue, I can't remember it. Like people ask me to look into this stuff and I'm at work. <laughs> so you gotta try to come up with the time to really not only converse with these folks and have a conversation to figure out exactly what they're trying to deal with, but time to talk with the proper agencies. There's no staffers. And that's why a lot of other governmental agencies in other states have constituent services. I have a friend of mine who's a state rep in El Paso. and He's got a person in El Paso whose job it is to work on these things. I have me. My mm -hmm. cell phone number is on the internet. My email is on the internet. You know, people call me and I try really hard um, to deal with this stuff in as, as best the way I can but it makes it difficult. So when we're talking about these issues that don't get addressed, there's a much deeper systematic problem here that is greater than the, the kind of the temporary partisanship we have now. And I think that's a much bigger contributor to those issues that the Sheriff's Association, for instance, brought up than anything else. Is there anything that can be done about that? Or is that <laughs> something that's- Change the Constitution. That's, right, so that's right. very difficult. Um, obviously, one of the other big things that didn't get passed this year was the capital outlay program. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what that means for Southern New Mexico? Sure. So let me try to break this down for, for your viewers simply, because a lot of times we talk about things that we expect other people to know, and that's not a good idea. <laughs> so every year, uh, we get funding from royalties, from taxes on oil and gas revenues. We project what those revenues are going to be and we, we borrow against it. We set up a bond where we say we're gonna have these revenues for X amount of years, and we get revenue that way. That revenue is used for capital projects. So what does that mean? Infrastructure, uh, buildings, sometimes roads, um, sewer systems, the whole run of the gamut of infrastructure things around the state. Most of the time what happens is that money is split between the governor uh, the Senate and the House. So the governor generally uses his or her money for big, what they call quote unquote statewide projects. So uh, the rail runner, uh, the spaceport, uh, large uh, water and wastewater facilities in Albuquerque that affect a whole bunch of people, those sorts of things. And then each senator and representative gets a chunk of money to use for projects around their area. Now, we in Las Cruces have generally done a very good job on a bipartisan basis of finding projects that we can all fund together. So there were two that I was gonna fund this year. Uh, one was to work on Airport Road mm -hmm. down in Santa Teresa, which is a big economic driver for the whole area. The other was to fund broadband internet for La Clinica de Familia. They are buying the old Las Cruces Hospital, which for a long time was an office building for the city of Las Cruces and renovating that into a, a really innovative health clinic with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare being passed. More people have insurance, and so they need somewhere to go get taken care of. And so our chunk of that that they asked us to fund was the broadband um, wiring needed for that building. And a bunch of us had put in a whole you know, money. I had put $100,000 of my money into that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also more uh, smaller projects that just are uh, applicable to your district. So for instance, I was going to find a, a fund a sidewalk in Tortugas and I was going to help fund a septic tank remediation in Mesilla. So when houses get built, uh, when they were built back in the 80s, for instance, there were not a lot of rules regarding septic tanks mm -hmm. and developers wanted to put up all these houses before sewer got put in. And so they put in a bunch of septic tanks in a very, uh, in a subdivision where all the houses were very dense. That's really not good for the water table. And so I really wanted to fund uh, sewer systems that would replace those septic tanks. Um, so I, that was what all my money was gonna go into. The problem there at the end was that there was a very, very large disagreement between Democrats in the Senate and Republicans in the House on two different things. The first is the governor wanted to do most of the roads in the state, especially the big ones, as part of this debt funding process. Now, Texas did this for a while. They don't want to look at a gas tax. They don't want to look at any other revenue stream because raising taxes in Texas is hard, right? Except that the only answer to that is to borrow, 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 borrow. They've hit their limit. There is no more money. They, they've run out of their credit card. They maxed it out. And there's no money left to actually build new roads or not even, to be honest with you, maintain the roads they have. So 
it's really surreal because usually the Democrats are the ones arguing for more money for infrastructure, whatever. The Democrats who were like, no, this is fiscally irresponsible. <laughs> this is not a good way of doing things. Republicans felt differently. The other issue is that the Republican leadership wanted to cut money to community colleges and senior centers. They basically wanted to cut most community colleges and 70% of the money going to senior centers around the state to help fund this. And Democrats were very against this from a public policy perspective. Uh, the Republicans put in their changes. Uh, we had a day to look them over, and they didn't bring it up on the floor of the House of Representatives until four hours, excuse me, three and a half hours before the uh, session ended at 12 o'clock on Saturday. And so that lack of ability to compromise on those two issues and find a way around that drove everything to fail. And so that money right now goes back into the pot. Uh, it does help grow the fund. And if it doesn't get used, then we'll have a lot more money next year. But unfortunately, that means that there's not a special session that is called by the governor. Um, all of the capital out outlay projects, so the infrastructure projects from around the state, don't get funded. Now, is that something that could have a ses special session call to? Have it could. Uh, the governor's, th there's two ways to call a special session. The governor can call one, and Bill Richardson used to do this all the time. He really didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this governor is, has some national ambitions. Uh, for instance, the night of the legislative session ending, she was already in Washington, D.C. And so I think she's got some priorities there that she wants to pursue. So I'm not sure those are going to fit into her plans. Um, I think two-thirds, I think it's two-thirds of the legislators can actually do a petition to call a special session. But once again, that's really hard for us. We have jobs. And if we go to a special session, we not only have to spend the money at the state level to um, hold the session, so to open the capital up again, to make sure all the staffers are there, et cetera, and so on. But also, we have to leave our work uh, because we don't get paid at all as a legislator. It's a volunteer job. So those things make it very difficult for us as legislators to actually call one of these things. So now, what was the thing that you were most disappointed didn't get done this legislative session? <laughs> um, I think the issue that needs to get addressed you know, there's, there's two issues for me. Uh, we've got to have tax reform at the state. And this is an economic development driver. We, we have some, something like 380 different carve outs in our gross receipts tax. And I'm actually a fairly progressive Democrat. I'm working with a pretty conservative Republican um, to have a proposal to broaden and flatten the tax code in the state. And we'll be bringing that up next time. I was kind of hoping that would get further this time so we could uh, answer what we call the off season. Uh, as we discuss it with a little bit more um, information from the legislators, but we're going to be doing that. The other thing that I felt was really disappointing was the testing issue. Our kids are over-tested. Uh, everyone knows this. And there's more and more and more testing being required in our public school system. And I, I honestly, truly believe that some folks are using this strategically to make public schools so hard that private schools become an option and they want to privatize schools. I, I never believed that before this session, but we saw people that were increasing testing, increasing burdens on teachers and public school parents, and yet offering pub, uh, private school vouchers. There was a voucher bill that was brought up and these are the same people. And so if you're trying to make public school that much harder and private school that much easier, you're trying to erode away what our public education system is. And I'm very, very opposed to that. And I think that it's so important for every kid in this state to have the ability to get those basic educational needs that will allow them to succeed in our economy. And I don't think we did a good job addressing that testing problem where teachers are teaching to the test, uh, students are basically becoming so frustrated and angry because all the we're in the middle of it right now. From the beginning of March to a lot of times the middle of May, it's test, 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 test. And that's not how you learn. It's just not. And so I was really disappointed that didn't get addressed more. A little bit got done. And I'll be talking with the Las Cruces Public Schools at their meeting on the 7th of April about some of the things that we were dealing with. But I think that should have been done more. Right now, um, we only have a few minutes left here. Uh, what happens during the off session now for a legislator? What are things that you work on? Well, there are interim committees. And so we meet starting in June on different committees to talk about things that matter to people all around the state and sometimes those can drag on but there are some things that get brought up that are very important we need to know about like I said we've got a, a 60 and a 30 day session 
to address all of these issues. If we can learn about things during the interim sessions, it helps us uh, deal with the, the things during the session on a more efficient basis, at least more efficient than we would have otherwise. The other thing is constituent services. You know, people get in touch with me all the time. Um, can you help me navigate the state bureaucracy for Medicaid? Uh, how do I do this thing with the DMB, et cetera, and so on? So we really deal with those sorts of issues, and I try to work really hard to stay in touch with people who I represent uh, in dealing with those. Right now, obviously, you mentioned that you were really active on social media. Does that help you be able to connect <laughs> with the people that in your constituency? I think so. You know, I did I did uh, anywhere between two and four minute little video every night at the legislative session, and I put it on Facebook and I linked it on Twitter. And people seem to really, uh, a lot of people seem to really appreciate that. You know, we here in southern New Mexico, many of us don't get uh, the Albuquerque news media, which generally covers the session. And, you know, our newspaper tries, but they can only send someone up there for the last week. And so I think there's a real craving for information. And um, hopefully those sorts of issues that legislators do and things that I do are one part of it. Other people do different things. Help people understand exactly what's going on so that they feel part of the process. That's really important in a democracy. If, if people lose interest and they don't feel like they are part of what's going on, they're not going to vote. And if they don't vote, only a very few people end up determining who the people are in the legislature that determine this public policy. I think democracy is stronger when everybody participates. And so for me, it's very important to try to encourage people to know that they have a voice, have conversations with me, and understand that they are part of the policymaking process. Without that interest, without that feeling like they're involved, democracy just doesn't work. And I would rather see it work. OK, great. Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of Your Legislators. And thank you for watching this season of Your Legislators. We'll see you next year when the session picks back up again.